Good morning, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, my name is Tom O'Malley, and I'm coming to you today from our kitchen here in Forestdale, Rhode Island, on half of the, behalf of the Worcester Center for Crafts. I really hope everyone's doing well out there. It's been a lot of change over just the last week. I can't imagine what's going on in all of your lives. I just know I'm happy to be here to share a little bit about pottery and about the things I love in pots. Um, I want to build on last week's um, demonstration of the cup and comfort in cups. And I want to expand that out to talk a bit about pots and the life they live by being part of everyday living in our lives. Um, we do have a couple friends here today. Uh, Lucy, our dog, is here and she sometimes has things to say about things. So hopefully she doesn't have a lot to say this morning, but you might hear her barking. And I am graced by the company of my wonderful wife, Phoebe uh, O'Malley, who is running our camera today. So a big thank you to them. A thank you to Lucy for being quiet and a thank you for, to Phoebe for uh, watching the camera. Uh, on the note of thank yous, I want to extend my gratitude uh, for all the people who are out there, whether you're pumping gas at the gas station, working in the supermarkets, and in particular, the folks who are in those emergency rooms and hospitals. I know some of you are some of them, and I know many of you have them in your circle of friends and family, and I can't express what gratitude I have for the work they're doing uh, throughout this. As you know, we have moved from a 15-day closure uh, across this country and at the Craft Center to a 30-day closure. And while that is challenging on many, many levels, um, staying home is the way to make this go away. So that's my message, is to please stay home. And we're doing our best work from our homes today uh, and practically every day, myself, and my colleagues at the Craft Center. Um, they're wonderful people, they're working hard, and again, it's our hope to be ready when, when this passes to get back to business as usual, to have all of you be a part of your lives our lives, I should say, uh, once again, and um, you are missed, uh, believe me. So today, as a way to kind of bridge this gap, um, I want to speak about pots in everyday living, uh, but I want to pick up where I left off. There was one little thing I didn't get to show you because all the pots I was working on last week were fresh, uh, were green, we were throwing, we were trimming, and there's one little finishing tip or trick that I want to show you. Um, this isn't any special tool. Uh, this is just the one that I happen to use. It's a sculpting tool and it is just something I found. What I like about it uh, are two things. It's tapered and it's pointed because what I'm going to do with it is what I call chasing cracks. And this is that last little step and tip on the mugs that I was making. So I would typically do this um, before I loaded the biskiln, and, or as I was loading the biskiln. And one of the last things I'm doing is I'm looking at that joint where we put the handle on, uh, both down here as well as up here. And I often find, and I do see one right here, I don't know if you all can see it, a little hairline crack. And so before this goes in the kiln, I want to say goodbye to that crack, so to speak. And so I'm gonna use this rounded blunt tool just to roll over that crack and just compress it closed. And I think a lot of times when we see a crack, uh, even earlier in the process when the pot is drying, our instincts may be to re-wet it, uh, to work some more slip in there, maybe to get some vinegar out, but a crack of this nature, and, and most cracks, you don't want to re-wet them because they're gonna open back up. They're gonna expand again as that water comes into the clay. And so this crack, I'm chasing away through compression. And hello, Lucy. And compression is our friend. Uh, we talked a lot about it last week when we were throwing. 
And it is something that comes into play again and again when we're clay forming. It could be slab rolling, it could be pinching, it could be throwing, it could be trimming. Uh, so a little more compression just at this very last stage closes that up and then I just soften that up with my finger. And again, I really love porcelain because it lets me cheat. It lets me rework things and come back to them without having to worry about pulling all that grog up. Uh, I just want to show you the foot on this piece. So this was the foot that we trimmed on the chuck and these were thrown off the hump and there were those two extra steps to help avoid S cracks. One was just before I trimmed this, I reached in and I compressed from the inside and outside at the very center. And the other is when I trim this, I try to get the thickness of this outer wall and the thickness of the foot to be as close as possible and not to have a huge variation in the foot ring. Um, so there's not a lot of extra thickness where this transitions and that's going to help alleviate the stress that sometimes leads to that S crack. So at this stage, I would typically sign this piece. So we'll put the signature on the inside of the foot. O'Malley is my signature. And I think every potter has their, their mark or their hack, uh, their way of letting us know who made the piece. I like signing at this stage with a blunt tool uh, because it lets me get a real clean line. Probably not the healthiest thing to do because it does make a little bit of clay dust, but we all make choices, I guess. So that's where we end up with the uh, wavy cup, right? The cup that was reminiscent of the human form of the body. And that goes on to this. Now, I process-wise, uh, these end up getting bisqued, and then I like to soda fire. And so in that, we're going to end up being on this extended um, From Home series, there's going to be more episodes. And one of the things I'm going to do, not next week, but a couple weeks down the road, is talk a little bit about that process of firing and glazing and what it is that I'm hoping to achieve in choosing to soda fire. So that's something to come, a little bit of previews. Um, where we're heading today is we're going to peek in my cupboard, uh, or our cupboard, and we're going to start, we're not going to go to all of them, um, we're going to start with the mug cupboard, and then we're going to swing around and we are going to look at a lot of pots I've pulled out that we have out on our table. Uh, it would just be a little too, um, too much movement to be running from one cupboard to another, right? So this cupboard is where we head every morning. Uh, I think I shared with you last week that uh, one of the questions out of um, our mouths in the morning, my wife and I, is who's going to walk the dog and who's going to make the coffee? And so once the coffee is made, uh, we've got to get in the cupboard and choose that cup. And I, I think I also said this is where I often see a lot of what I consider my friends in that I've chosen to collect these pots for many reasons over the years, and my wife has collected them, and they've come to us as gifts. Um, they've come into our lives in lots of different ways, as I'm sure pots do into your lives, including the ones you make and, and grow to love and experience. And one of the things that as a maker, um, when I put on my hat as a user up here in the kitchen is I'm evaluating, right? I'm touching base with that pot. I'm asking questions about why it was made the way that it's made. I'm asking questions about the decisions that the potter made. And that's kind of exciting because our minds all work differently. We have different reasons and motivations for making pots. About, oh gosh, almost 30 years ago, I wrote a paper when I was in grad school that said something to the effect that glassware, tinware, and Tupperware made the handmade pot as a utilitarian object nearly obsolete. Uh, meaning that if we think about our needs as human beings, as a human race, that we don't necessarily need a handmade pot today. There are a lot of other options. So they're in a utilitarian sense. So that need, and when we think about what's going on today, we're hearing a lot about self-care in the world and, and tuning into what 
our needs are, that need comes from in here. What is it about the handmade pot that we need? And that answer comes on different levels at different times by each and every one of us. And I think that's one of the interesting things about getting to know a pot over a lifetime or over many years is that you get to answer that question again and again. And a little later I'm going to show you some pieces that I have in my collection in, in our daily use. And all the pots I'm showing you today are used daily that I have had for going on 35 years. And the answer as to what needs they fulfill probably has changed a dozen times and maybe looped back around again, who knows. But those are long stories because those are long histories that we have. So jumping into the cupboard. It always is interesting to me to see what's going on with the relationships in here. As we unload the dishwasher, which is just on the other side of the room, we're probably in the middle of conversation, thinking about what the day is going to bring, and we're just putting things away. They just end up ending up in here. And what always amuses me, and sometimes I even photograph it, is the relationships that are going on in the cupboard. And while they're not doing it right now, uh, the other evening I opened the cupboard, and this is a little a beautiful little demi toss mug by a potter named John Glick, um, who is, has passed. He's unfortunately no longer with us, but he ran Plum Tree Pottery up in Michigan for many, many years. And this is a pot I've had in my life for some time now. And this is another mug by uh, Holly Walker. And Holly's, wa uh, Holly's mug has such a different spirit than John's. Uh, it's kind of fun to look at them here side by side. But the moment that I had when I opened that cupboard is they were nestled. And I, I, I hope you can see that, that little negative space that somehow Holly's cup and John's cup knew each other. They were like spooning together. And it just made me smile to think how this collective unconsciousness of makers comes together in the kitchen. And everyone's kitchen has other people's pots and different pots in them. And so that combination and that recombination is so exciting. So I'll just stop for a second and talk about what makes these special cups uh, for me. I think John's cup has a sense of um, true utilitarianness to it. And what tells that to me is this handle that is almost the complete height of the cup. Uh, because that's the size of the hand, even though it's a small little demitasse and it looks a little overstated, there's a beauty and comfort to that handle that, uh, you know, I'm not having to pinch my little finger out and, and, and pull my other fingers in to get around a little tiny handle. There's a real handle on here, good two finger handle with a thumb grip. So I can drink some heavy liquids out of this cup. And I certainly, this is not large enough for coffee or even tea. And so those do tend to be more concentrated liquids, stronger liquids. Um, I'm not an espresso drinker, so it's not espresso. It's more likely to be whiskey or wine in my house, but that's just the way it rolls. Holly's cup is kind of a, a, a subtle comparison is this joyful cup. And if you've ever seen Holly, she wears socks that have stripes often and bright clothing. And there's just a sense of her personality in this cup that really speaks to me. And it is like visiting her when I pull this cup out and use it. It's a handmade cup, a hand pinched cup, excuse me, beautiful touching going on all around the police, the piece a real sense of the potter's touch and the time that it took to make every one of those marks. The other thing I love is the humor. Uh, we do wash our cups well, and uh, this is a glaze mark that the art artist has chosen to leave or make, I should say, in the cup. And that, that sense of the old coffee stain and that lovely humor of it all is just really, um, warms my heart every time I see it and use it. And so that's another special cup. Although I must say it's not one that I pull out very often. Not quite the capacity for coffee for me. I showed you that Rob Cartelli cup last week. Uh, but 
it's a great cup for tea. And I think Phoebe uses it uh, probably more than I do. She's giving me a big thumbs up behind the camera there. Um, so those are two that tell some wonderful stories. And you know, in thinking about today's conversation, I was thinking about why do we collect? What are the choices we make? And I said a moment ago, sometimes we choose to bring the pots into our lives ourselves. Sometimes they're given to us. Maybe we trade. Maybe they're gifts. Um, you know, why they come into our lives? I think that's a really interesting question. And sometimes I'm just blown away with the beauty of a piece. And although I didn't select this piece, it was actually a gift given to me. This is a um, little Yanomi or, or tea bowl by Sebastian Mo. And the glazing on here is amazing, as well as the form and the touch that has been brought to this piece. It really, really speaks to me as a piece of, there's skill, there's investment, there's a lot of, I think the word that I'm looking for relative to a piece like this is care. And I see it every step of the way um, with this piece. And I'm not saying that John and, and Holly's pieces don't exhibit that either, but the care that's given to this piece really blows me away. And it's something that I enjoy experiencing every time. And it's a piece that I really enjoy holding in my hand. It doesn't have a handle, so I have to do that. It is a piece that cool beverages are good in, and um, it's a piece that has exquisite glazing, and I hope that will show up well. It's a little dark today. We don't have much sunshine, so we have a lot of lights on, but I hope you're able to see the subtlety of that. If you're not, let me know, and I'll put a picture of this up on, online later on, because there's something very special about that glaze, as well as all the steps in the care. And that's a little piece of the story that pots tell me as a maker. Because I understand the process, and not that you have to be a maker to understand process. A lot of people understand process and appreciate it. There's a story to every piece about those decisions someone chose to make. Another favorite pot of mine is this pot by, um, oh my gosh. <laughs> Malcolm, of course, Malcolm Davis. And um, I think whenever I look at this little, you know me, this beautiful little cup, which has this amazing Chino carbon trap glaze that Malcolm is so uh, known for, or was so no known for, I think of one getting the pot from Malcolm at Demarest years ago when he was still with us, and two, the life it's lived with me and the experience of getting to know it, getting to know these marks, getting to know these throw lines, getting to know, you know, this is a very light cup, uh, but Malcolm has a nice thick foot ring on here. Interesting choices, uh, probably because of the type of firing that this had to go through, a longer, uh, heavier reduction, maybe a little hotter, being porcelain, uh, helping to control that warping. Beautiful round foot ring on here, yet the pot itself is a slightly uh, oval rectangle. Malcolm said something that has stayed with me um, to this day. I attended a couple workshops with him, and he said, a pot without soul is just clay around a hole. And I think that every pot that Malcolm made really encompassed that, that there's a life in this piece. And that's a beautiful thing. That reminds me of something many people say about art and art that we collect and bring into our lives, is that you're collecting a little bit of the artist's life because it took them time and effort to make that piece. And I really like that. I really like thinking those little bits of, of people's lives are here with us today. We have a lot of cups in here. I'm not going to pull them all out, but um, a couple more favorites. This is one uh, that I got a few years back by trading with a wonderful potter named Carrie Joseph. And for those who know me and know my aesthetic, you can see what was so attractive to this. 
And it's interesting, I ask again that question, why do I buy or, or bring the pots that I choose to bring into my life? And it's not that I'm necessarily trying to emulate my own aesthetic as a maker, but there's something in the other maker's aesthetic that I really appreciate. And that's another reason why I bring them into my lives. And I think all of you do. Um, I do hope to be able to take some questions at, um, in that my hands are clean this week and we'll take a little break perhaps when we rotate around to touch in on a few of those or if Phoebe sees any popping up on the feed as she's doing her camera work, maybe she'll shout them out to me. But um, this piece, it has so much in common with what I try to achieve in my work, yet I think it's so different. There's a, a sense of attention and care in this piece that's very different than what I bring to mind. And I really appreciate that about Carrie's piece here. Um, this is an amazingly light little cup. And uh, I had forgotten about it. It gets buried. It's dark and the cupboard is dark. It gets buried back there. And I was putting my thinking hat on over the last couple of days and I said, where's Carrie Joseph's little cup? We've got to bring that one out and share it. It's very, very special. I th the other thing that really speaks to me is when a potter embraces the material as part of the aesthetic. As I said, I enjoy soda firing, and again, we'll talk about that a little bit more down the road uh, as a choice that I make. But Material and process, they're so much a part of the crafts. And when I see a potter who rejoices in that, uh, both in the making and the finishing of a piece, I'm really drawn to it. And this You Know Me by Ron Myers, I think is a wonderful, wonderful example of that. Ron throws and works clay in such a fresh way that it has a vitality uh, that I think stays with the piece even after it has been finished. And often we look at fresh pots right off the wheel or right off the hand building table and we think, oh, that's when they're alive. And often they are in a way that we can't recapture through firing. But the decisions that Ron made on this cup are uh, pretty amazing in my mind. One, it, the way he trims a foot with fresh clay and really lets that freshness, that, that sense of this um, having just been trimmed, he's not getting all tight the way some of us do. He's just letting that material speak. And as a maker, that really, really speaks to me. The other decision, and I, I love this, it's, it's part of the history of so many pots. You can go into museums and see this on pieces. We've got the thumb, we've got the forefinger, we've got the middle finger, and then all five fingers on here um, when Ron dipped this into the flashing slip. Okay, so that is just a wonderful moment I'm having right now because my hand is exactly where his was. And there's just a beautiful history. Pots record every fingerprint. You can go into museums and if you're fortunate enough to pick up where you have access to collections of pots that are hundreds or even thousands of years old, and you can find the maker's fingerprints or the people who handled the piece as it was moving through the process. It's just a, um, a connection to our history that's quite amazing and quite beautiful. And then of course the raven in this case. And many times Ron's characters uh, have stories and um, this one is the raven and I'm in this moment I'm not remembering the story that goes with it. And this is earthenware and it's been a low fire salt firing um, which is also pretty pretty spectacular. Uh, unglazed, uh, well actually there's a little bit of a clear glaze in there but that's it. And so it has that tactile quality that's just wonderful as well. So Ron Myers, a beautiful, very, very spirited piece. Again, that, that process of decision that the makers go through is pretty, um, pretty amazing. And this is a cup, actually it's my wife's, it's a tumbler, 
and it was made by Peter Biesecker. And I bought this while she was chatting with Peter behind her back and gave it to her for Christmas or birthday? Birthday. Birthday that year. And um, we have a lot of Peter Potts, but this one spoke to me in a way that was pretty special. Um, and Peter, I think, is a real master of those decision-making uh, processes, and he lets that really show in his work in a way that I think is um, inspiring, really. I, so, what are some of those choices? Well, first, just to start with this lovely runny glaze that is moving down the piece almost as if it's flowing like water right now. These lovely little dots of underglaze that he's put on there just to accentuate, just to break up that surface, just to enliven it and create a little moment of contrast in there. And then as someone who loves to cut into clay and facet, this piece really spoke to me for these beautiful facets that this piece was thrown much thicker than it is now. And it um, was cut back and he left these ribs about every one, two, three, every third of the way around on the piece for the hand to find and experience as it was being used. I think the other wonderful, wonderful decision is that those ribs and all that faceting would inform the shape of the foot. And so the foot becomes carved and it's an interesting story. So we have clay being worked in a subtractive way at the very back of the piece. And then as we turn it over and come to the top, almost a perfect circle returns that story of the potter's wheel, um, that perfection, that lovely rim we talked about last week down in my studio is here. And so the pot provides a contrast. And I think I mentioned that quote, um, or my misquote maybe, but I keep attributing it to Bernard Leach over the years, that if you take care of beginnings and endings, the middle will take care of itself. Well, I think Peter's taken care of everything on this piece, and it's really one of my favorites that we have, and it's a joyful piece to use. Um, and I guess maybe I've absconded it from my wife, who I gave it to. Um, but we like to share in our family. I think in, in, in antithesis to that piece uh, is this interesting one, um, this real dark and moody piece that holds round its slip cast. Um, and then the potter, Rick Haynes, uh, has made a choice to just loosen up that rim. And this is something Rick does, I think, better than anyone. I don't think this is a piece that is his tour de force of that technique, but it really brings a smile to my face. And this was actually a vase at um, his son's wedding that we were able to bring home with us. But really coming to this rim, this little tiny moment again and again is something that I really, really appreciate about this piece and I find to be very special. Um, coincidentally, oh no, it's not in the cover probably in your car, the, 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 um, the spiny travel cup. Oh, <laughs> oh well, um, there's a travel cup that we have that the lid actually happens to fit this, <laughs> and that's why it went from the vase covered to <laughs> the uh, mug and cup covered, just, just so you understand. Um, but I, I, I enjoy That's a good cup for a gin and tonic. Um, so let's see, just two, maybe three more while I'm in here. Um, well, two more. So this piece uh, is really one of my favorites, and it's uh, a piece by a student of mine who I don't think is making pots anymore, um, Rebecca Lesnick. She went on to become a lawyer. She did the School for Professional Crafts program with us a number of years ago. And this was part of kind of what I would call her senior thesis work. Uh, actually, no, this was, she stayed on for another year as an artist in residence, and this was part of her exploration. And her ability to carve and um, create this beautiful pattern of ginkgo leaves is so impressive and, and so amazing. Uh, from the first time that I saw it 
to every time that I've seen it since. And as I hold it here today, this is a pot that still really speaks to me. And it's one of our favorites in our, in our home. It's a pot that I know a lot of our guests gravitate to. And then her use of this beautiful celadon glaze and then soda firing to create this variation uh, in the surface that's quite impressive. Uh, another beautiful pot and it really feels great in the hand and um, it's got a nice little foot on it as well where all these stems come and culminate around this well-crafted and thoughtful foot ring. So another favorite of mine uh, and I would say the spirit of this piece is the thing that really, really speaks to me. I think I'll pull out another Peter piece in contrast, um, although I, I don't want to say Peter's pieces don't have spirit, but the thing that blows me away about this piece and, and a lot of Peter's work is the technical ability that's expressed in the pieces and how that, that technique, that command of materials and process becomes such a statement in how well designed and well made and well formed these pots are. Um, but then this playfulness and this inventiveness that this pot represents. This is a martini glass, believe it or not. And if you look inside, and I hope we can get the angle right that you see, it's a lovely taper, a little teardrop taper inside, very, very uh, traditional to the martini glass. So it has, it's a double wall cup, and it has that beautiful taper on the inside. Um, it's double walled because this becomes insulation, that your hand isn't going to warm up your martini and melt that ice and dilute it. Um, so it's very, very thoughtful in that regard. And it's a strong form, a lovely statement in this soft celadon blue glaze. And then just the beauty and use that can come to you, not only through those wonderful design, de design, design decisions, say that 10 times fast, but the fact that Peter gives you this little window into the foot of the piece into that interior, that beautiful double walled section. And um, the, it's glazed black in there. And it is, it is a beautiful little discovery for anyone who's using this piece. So that's a, another lovely cup by Peter Giesecker. Um, I could go on for hours and um, I'm gonna transition away from the cup cupboard and um, we're going to swing around and move over to the table. Um, I'm going to see if there are any questions. I'm going to grab the laptop for a second while I'm sitting there and um, we'll talk a little bit about what we've covered so far and then we'll get into the pieces that are on the table. Again, I thank you for joining me today. I'm Tom O'Malley and I'm coming to you from our home. My wife Phoebe is with me running the camera here in Forestdale, Rhode Island on behalf of the Worcester Center for Crafts. And I really appreciate everyone tuning in this morning. Sorry about those technical glitches. Fingers are crossed that they don't continue or come back. So I'm going to join you over here at the table. Let me just have a quick glance if there are any questions going on. So, um, hmm, they're not scrolling. <laughs> well, I think we're okay then. If you want to throw up a question, I'm looking at the um, screen of the laptop right now. So if you want to do that, um, I can respond to it. Let's see. I know there's a little bit of a, a delay. All right, I'm just going to put this down at my feet, and if my glasses are good today, I'll, I'll be able to see. <laughs> So over here at the table, I've kind of gone into the other cupboards around the kitchen and pulled out, <laughs> and it's amazing. It is like seeing old friends because we don't use every pot every day by any means. And um, it, it's funny, you know, to rediscover things. For instance, 
Um, I guess I'll start with probably one of the, the most, thank you, hon, one of the most lively pots on the table, which is this plate by Lisa Orr. Mm -hmm. And this is a, a plate that has a lot of loose throwing and lots of sprigging going on. Um, and then this amazing uh, glazing that's influenced by tricolor, Chinese tricolor wear. And um, it is a lively plate. And for those of us who know chefs and talk with chefs, often we're told that the plates need to complement the food. And this is a plate that you've got to have the right food on here because um, that relationship is a real dynamic one. But boy, what a, a piece full of spirit. And on kind of an aside note, um, Lisa is someone who has a condition, I believe it's known as synesthesia. And she wrote about this in a wonderful article. Um, the Studio Potter Journal many years ago did a whole issue on color. And Lisa wrote about how colors make her see numbers, if I'm remembering the story right, and how um, that has influenced her use of color in her, wor her work. And uh, it's really probably one of the most strongly colored pieces on the table. Um, that's our friend Lucy. She's saying hi. Um, so I'll just stay with plates for a moment. This is actually one of our newest plates. It's a plate by one of the students at the Craft Center, Cindy White, and it came to us through the pasta dinner. And I must say, this plate has become one of my wife's favorites very, very quickly in our home. <laughs> Um, and part of it is it's beautifully made. It's got some beautiful glaze and applique on it, um, but also the size and the shape. And so unlike a lot of our pieces here that are round, this piece uh, brings the rectangle to the table and that really changes things. And if you think about how your table comes together, this is a plate that I think uh, can offer some variety in a way that maybe others or not that many that we have in our collection uh, do. Yet, you know, here's this Doug, beautiful Doug Peltzman plate, one, two, three, four, five, six uh, sided, and his very, very dynamic and wonderful decorative style, um, a lot of attention to detail. So, a ge you know, a geometric solid, a simple form that is so strong because of its plain geometry, but is activated and enlivened by all of this surface work that's going on. Um, some wonderful, wonderful choices. Again, I really enjoy the surprises that the dishwasher gets to experience. Not everyone at the table can turn their plate over. You spill the food, but boy, when you've got them on the counter and you're loading them into the dishwasher, you get to look at these little details. So Doug gave us this wonderful uh, bullseye, but I also love the way the oxides that he has created this inlay uh, bleed out into the glaze. And let me bring that up a little closer so you can see it. And that's just uh, really speaks to me in a, in a wonderful way. And we do have it on the front as well, but it's caught up in all this activity. So I like that clarity. Um, another beautiful piece. Uh, speaking about who can look at the bottom of a plate when you're sitting at a table, I, I don't know if this is true, but I tell the story, and I'm Irish, so I get to tell these types of stories. Miss Manners says that uh, only potters can pick up and look at the bottom of their flatware while they're dining. Um, they're the only ones who have that right, otherwise it's very, very rude. This is a beautiful plate by Brenda Quinn that my wife is uh, very drawn to as well. We are talking last week about how color can create um, comfort and inspiration and draw us in. And I think Brenda's beautiful, um, almost tealy blue is quite um, striking here, but also her inlay glaze technique where these leaves 
and um, stem are one blaze, not on another, but laid in beside the other. And um, it's a really striking technique, and I know she's a real glaze master, and if you ever want to learn about the use of um, in glaze inlay and things like CMC gum and um, glaze additives that let you be creative in a way that you see Brenda exploring here, she's written some really good articles about it as well. Um, a little quieter on the other side, and um, you know, that's okay. It's, it's a nice contrast. Uh, another beautiful piece, again, that pure geometry of the circle, really enjoy. It's amazing um, when you are just living with pots, sometimes we stop thinking about them, which is probably not a bad thing. I tend to, I'm really thinking about them a lot today, right? Sometimes just the use can be beautiful unto itself. And I pulled these out of our cupboard because these are pots that get used in cooking and a little bit in serving like hors d'oeuvres and stuff, but we don't do that every day, but we cook every day. And so if you need to prep, um, and, and chop and have a little pot to put, put um, those scallions or those onions uh, or those um, sun-dried tomatoes in, we reach into the cupboard and we pull these out. So another Doug Peltzman, a Bertie Boone, um, a little circle just by me, and we'll come back to kind of that in another pot. And then uh, an older Kevin Snipes. Uh, Kevin did a residency with us many, many years ago, and I was fortunate enough to acquire a number of his pots, a couple cups, and a couple of these small bowls. And Kevin's highly decorative and narrative style um, is very present on them. But they're really a pot that we go to because of the size and how utilitarian it is, which is, is kind of wonderful in its own right. And so I brought that little grouping out. I think I would include Julie Crosby's um, little, it's really not a batter bowl because you wouldn't, it's a little sauce bowl, I guess. So it has a beautiful spout. That lip is just luscious. And um, it's been wood fired and has these beautiful markings, a little chino liner in there. That's another great little pot. It gets used anything from a salt cellar to mixing up a quick sauce to pour over um, your meal at the very end, uh, at the beginning of service, at the end of cooking it. Uh, or my wife likes to use it as a spoon rest on the stove. Um, it has so many ways that it may be used. And that's something else I was thinking about as I was walking around our home and looking at the pots that we live in with, not in, uh, <laughs> with, but sometimes it feels like we live in them. The potter who lived in a pot. That's another story. <laughs> but Julie's pot is one that reminds me of how often the maker has one intention and the user has another. And so I think about, and we're not going to swing to it, but right over there is a picture by Tom Ladd that's full of spoons and cooking utensils and how we use pitchers in, in different ways uh, in our lives. Sometimes they become vases. Um, how people will often know, oh, here's a Steve Murphy wine cup that we picked up a few years back at a mud flat um, fundraiser. And it's become, Phoebe's gotten very precise in her cooking. So it's become the home of the uh, half teaspoon and tablespoon measures. Um, so the user certainly gets to reinterpret the intention of the maker. And that can be pretty special too. Um, I don't know. I think it's something we all have our own take on and maybe bring our own uh, sensibility to. Speaking of um, going over to Mudflat, um, they do these wonderful sales. And years ago, we were at a studio sale shortly after I think they had opened the new facility in Somerville. And we wandered into a studio that had the most amazing pots that I had not ever seen before. Um, and it was just a delight to sort of discover uh, some new pottery. Uh, I guess we're having some power issues here in the Great North. But um, 
This is a piece of bowl by Kyla Toomey, and we, we purchased two that day. And there was an attendant there, but Kyla wasn't in the room. Uh, but we were told she was there, and I said, oh, I'd love to meet Kyla. And uh, so we kind of hung out in her space. I don't know, 15, 20 minutes went by, and Kyla came in. And um, she's, if you know her, and I'm sure many of you do, she's a very effacive, very gregarious, very alive individual. And we were immediately confronted with the beauty of that. And um, it, it kind of becomes the joke today, now that we've become friends, that um, the person who, who went to tell Kyla that um, somebody wanted to meet her, you know, probably said something to the effect, oh, there's a couple of really old people in your studio who like your pots. Maybe you want to go in and meet them. Um, but that's just the made up part of the story. But what attracted us to this is how this potter, how Kyla can handle this clay almost as if it were fabric, um, almost as if it were cloth and bring this decorative sensibility to the surface with such a facility. And um, you saw last week one of her little cups that we have. Um, we have two of these bowls. These are bowls that we use day in and day out. It's pretty amazing. And they are, um, I think this is back, uh, like maybe they're cone 10 oxidation. Um, they're durable, they're strong, and um, they're really special in that way. And speaking of that durability and that strength that pots have, um, I brought out a couple of pieces on that note. Um, one is this little plain, quiet celadon bowl. And um, this is a pot I made back in the late 1990s when I first got to Worcester. And I made a whole bunch of them, but two of them came to live with us. Um, we're down to one. Um, so this is a little over 25 years old. Um, it's not a very exciting pot. If anything, it's what we might call a quiet pot. But boy, it's a workhorse. This has been an ice cream bowl, a cereal bowl, a prep bowl, a service bowl. It's been dropped on the floor. It's bounced. <laughs> it's come back. It goes in the dishwasher. It goes in the cupboard. It stacks up. It does all those things. And I really appreciate this pot for that aspect. Um, it's sort of so different than, than maybe... Um, the Ron Myers You Know Me, which has so many wonderful stories in it um, that were consciously deposited by the maker. Here, this was just a, probably a demo I did. I don't even remember. And this pot has had a real impact on our lives and, and is one that brings us a lot of joy. And I think that's when pots succeed in the kitchen. They, they fulfill the function and the utility that they have but they also bring you joy and happiness. And I think that is such a special thing. So this is another pot on that note, just another quickie. It's another one that I made. I was just needing to make some pieces to fill some dead space in a soda kiln. And so I just pulled out some stoneware one day and I threw a bunch of these, uh, and it's probably even reclaim, um, these bowls and then just said, oh, let's give them a little life. So I threw some slip in them and then spiraled up through it. And then just a chino glaze on the inside. Not a pot with, it's got a little more character than that green one, right? A little energy in there and a little subtle smoldering uh, story to tell here in terms of the variation. But it's not a pot I made with a lot of intention. And I tell you, this is another pot that we use day in and day out. We use Phoebe saying we use it all the time. Um, so there's something that happens there. This is another pot I want to tell a story about. It was made probably 35 to 38 years ago. Um, so when we say, you know, the pots, when the teacher says to you, the pots that you make are going to last forever. Uh, maybe they can. I hope this one does. This was made by a studio mate of mine back when I was a student uh, in undergraduate school, and his name was Barry, or is Barry Klaipavka. Um, I've long ago lost touch with Barry, but his bowl stays with us and is used again and again. And I ended up with this bowl because uh, Barry was testing the CM Shino, 
and I was firing some of my very first reduction kilns. And I think um, for my intentions, I ended up over reducing the kiln, this little catenary arch kiln at school uh, we had. And, uh, but boy, for Shino, it was great because it, it created these wonderful carbon trap deposits um, that were quite, quite beautiful and still are. And the piece, again, has lived a long life with us, and I hope it continues to do so and, and maybe even outlives us uh, in that respect. Keep going, 100 years out of that pot. Um, you can see another kind of wide range of bowls happening here. There's a very special one here that um, is my wife's bowl. And when we talk about longevity and, and staying with you, this was her childhood bowl. And she still has it. It is a commercial pot. It's um, a Centura by Corning. Corningware. Lovely, young, life, uh, lively, I should say, decoration on the interior. Um, but this has traveled across the country with her and back. It has gone into the moving van. It's gone into the cupboard in eight, ten different houses and homes, and she still has it today. And it's a real testament to the longevity of pots and how over time their story with us becomes richer and richer. Pretty amazing. Speaking of time, yeah, we're getting on um, almost an hour. I just have a few more pieces that I want to go over. Um, this is a lovely piece by Rose Dawson, who did a residency with us. She came out of RISD a number of years ago, and her decorative technique and her ability to bring visual narrative to the surface of her pieces is quite amazing. And so these fish, she does a lot of sea-based um, themes and lives down in um, Dartmouth, in the Dartmouth area, and teaches out, I believe, at Framingham State, and fires these in a, a wood kiln that Julie Crosby uh, built with her called Monty, I believe. And so this is uh, one of the pieces out of Monty, beautiful porcelain piece with just some amazing decoration. And that undulation of decoration and form um, really spoke to me with this piece. And speaking of Julie, we talked about her little piece. This is a basket by her, and, and this isn't easy. Um, doing all this in sizing and doing it so consistently and then doing it in a way that creates a beautiful, durable, long-lasting piece. And then um, Julie complicates it a little bit more. She wood fires it. And so um, the story of the fire is another aspect that I'm really drawn to on this piece. And you can see that history. You can see the wadding marks around the foot here. Um, that tell that story and then you can see the change. This just has flashing slip on it. This is one of our favorite pieces to use. It usually lives in our living room and we keep our, our evening fruit in there. Um, sometimes quiet little pieces. We bought this for someone else and we liked it so much we never gave it to them. <laughs> bad. True Confessions of a Potter, a beautiful Nicole Aquilano uh, thimble cup or shot glass. And there's something about this piece and this detailed decoration that's on here that pulls you in and creates an intimacy with the piece that you don't necessarily have with these larger pieces. Um, a beautiful candy dish uh, by Christian Kiefer. Um, some quieter pieces over here that I want to touch on sort of as a grouping. Um, Liz Lurie, who makes these beautiful unglazed wood-fired pieces, and her sensibility in terms of, again, decision-making and how the story of those decisions are told on the piece. And I just love these tiny little lugs and the little holes that she chose to put in there and the reference to historic pots and historic forms. Liz looks at a lot of pieces made in other mediums, um, wood being, being one of them. Um, Lindsay Ostreiter, uh, this is a piece I fell in love with at uh, the Providence Ensica. Um, it was at the Santa Fe Clay um, tabletop show that they do and uh, La Mesa show. 
And the dark, deep, brooding sensibility in this piece, I hope we can get enough light in there today, um, just spoke to me in a wonderful, wonderful way. But again, those wonderful decisions by the maker, this hard circle, and this is wood-fired, probably really hot, you know, cone, I don't know, 10, 11, 12, maybe even hotter than that. I'd have to check with Lindsay on that. Um, and then this, oh, this piece of clay, this little slab that's been laid over like a piece of metal to create a gripping point um, for using this in a very usable, functional way as a batter bowl. And that lovely spout, another lovely, lovely piece that really, really speaks to me. Um, one of our, <laughs> Lucy likes it too. One of our more recent acquisitions is this berry bowl uh, by Michelle Gray. And this is a wonderful piece in terms of, again, of those decisions. And I've always enjoyed how Michelle makes decisions about not just form, but form and surface, and how those decisions begin very early on with a piece like this. And this has become a piece that we use um, several times a week as we rinse and strain and dry our berries. So it's another favorite. Um, the one thing that we often end up doing is, is pairing it up. Again, those little pots that don't necessarily have a lot of high volume character that get used in interesting ways. We put it on a little draining plate um, so those berries don't get on our, uh, the water doesn't get on our table. And I have to say, one of my favorite potters uh, out there in the world is Jody Johnstone's work. And Jody, as a person, is so wonderful and um, quite, quite a musician as well. Um, this is a faceted bowl we have by Jody that obviously has become our candy bowl. I'm going to transfer those. And uh, beautiful interior. She fires a large onagon up in uh, Maine, up, I think outside of Belfast, um, and a beautiful piece here, again, telling the story. And, you know, when pots don't have to be round, I also find that really, really interesting. And then this is our butter dish by Jody, and using the um, Japanese technique of rice straw, which lays down a silica pattern on the pieces that uh, occurs in the loading. And I love faceting and that, that beautiful facet there on the lid, um, quite quite a piece. And we do use it, honest, it's got, got butter in there. It's another favorite of ours. And kind of one of my all time favorite pieces is right here. And it doesn't usually live in this configuration in our cupboard. Um, this is a piece by Hiroe Hanazono and is probably 25, you know, 20, 25 years old now. Hiroe did a residency at the center um, many years ago and made some beautiful pots like this, which um, are a little different than what she makes today, um, but show her Japanese influence um, and her understanding of that culture in which she grew up in um, and kind of has that quality of a bento box. And, um, what we have in here is this lovely contrast, which in my own work is something I try to celebrate, of the dark clay, the rough surface, to the refined clay. And so this half of the piece usually lives up in our cabinet, stowed away. These four plates get used day in and day out, again and again and again, in so many different ways. They are really some of my most favorite pots that we have in our home. And they have this beautiful uh, light blue celadon glaze. They have this beautiful stamping and sizing that has let that celadon pool and create those amazing colors. And then this attention to detail. So thrown, but then cut out foot creating these four lovely um, cardinal points on the base of the piece and another stamp. So really appreciating those decisions that the maker has given to the piece. These were thrown round on the wheel and then carefully cut back. And that sensitivity, even though this is a cut rim, that sensitivity to refinement 
Um, and again, really simple pieces that to me have a strong presence of the maker and have a strong presence of the decisions that they made while making them. And I think those decisions continue to speak today. And I think that's really what all of these pots have in common is that they speak to us and they bring that joy uh, through use into our lives. That is so important. So this has been Tom O'Malley coming to you from Forestdale, Rhode Island. And uh, on behalf of the Worcester Center for Crafts, and it's been exciting again to connect with everyone, um, to all of our students and our friends out there. We miss you dearly. We hope you stay safe. Um, I really think the best advice today is stay home. Um, we're doing our best to do that. And um, I will continue to do these as long as I'm in the stay home mode. So I do hope to rejoin you again next Friday. And um, we're gonna go back down into the studio. We're gonna look at this style of, um, this Karanuki style of forming. In this case, this is a thrown fruit bowl. Um, as well as solid form forms. And I'm also going to throw a porcelain bowl and talk about how to get a very gradual and flowing curve in your bowls, your thrown bowls, um, which can sometimes be challenging as you transition. So that's what the topic will be next week. Um, similarly to last week, and I think it may have gotten cut off the ending of last week's video, but I really want to encourage people to support makers out there. Um, these are hard economic times for everyone uh, for many, many reasons, and I don't think any one of us is different from the other in that regard. But if you can support the makers uh, who have missed their shows um, because they've been canceled or pushed back, um, we at the center have had to cancel the Pottery Invitational next month. Um, because of this, we're hoping to do some online form. Um, there's an amazing amount of online education going on right now. So tap into that. Continue to feed your soul. I hope you have some clay at home. And I really, really look forward to seeing you next week. And I thank you very much for spending some time with us this morning. Take care.